making it clear that God is God and we are not. And God was shining with every color of the rainbow and thunder and lightning were crashing around God as a throne as they all gathered together to praise the Creator. And it was this just breathtaking scene. As we turn to chapter 5 today, John notices that God, the one on the throne, holds a scroll that has seven seals upon it. Now we need to remember that the Revelation is written to seven real churches that contain real people, just like you and me, right? And all those real people, they lived in the first century. They would have been quite used to the image of a scroll that is sealed. Kings and dignitaries sent them around to the cities that they ruled with edicts and proclamations about this or that new rule for their lives, right? And the seal ensured that the message in the scroll was from the one whose ring was pressed into that wax that created the seal. It ensured that the message had not been tampered with. And that it was indeed the will of the one who sent it. When a sealed scroll was brought out, the people knew that something important was about to be shared. And they knew that they needed to listen up, right? They also were used to scrolls in worship. See, they didn't have bound books printed on printing presses and distributed through publishers and bookstores and available on their Kindles or their audiobooks app, like we do today. Everything they read had been copied by hand and delivered by a messenger, snail mail style, even snailier than snail mail style, right? And they kept those scrolls containing the scriptures of God in safe, secure, sacred places. I had the opportunity to worship on occasion with the Jewish community in Barrington, Rhode Island, where I served a small church for seven years. The synagogue was this lovely community of faithful people, and they often invited me and other non-Jewish folks from the wider community to join them for worship so that we could understand and know each other at a deeper level. When it was time for reading the scripture, they would go to this little, little box, little space that they had in the wall, and they would open that up, and they would bring the scroll out, literally a scroll. It had two, uh, it was probably two to three feet wide, about three feet wide, and it had two wooden spindles, one on each side, so that they could roll it this way or that way and find the scripture reading for that day. The scroll in God's hand in the heavenly throne room would have contained God's word, God's edict and proclamation for the people of those seven real churches, for John and for all of creation. They believed that God still spoke through God's word long after Christ was gone from their sight. And they believed that that word meant life for them. So they longed to hear it. Our worship, too, is centered on word and sacrament, isn't it? We come to this time and this space in order to once again bring out the scroll of God and hear in it God's word that is for us today. We come to listen. Trusting that in that listening, we will encounter the God who has given us life, who loves us unconditionally and has the power to transform our aching hearts and world. Amen? Amen? We come to participate in this heavenly banquet feast, a foretaste of what is in store for us, but also what is gifted to us for right now. We come at God's command and invitation and promise that we will there be forgiven and nourished and set on our feet once again. But the scroll that John sees is sealed. It's closed up, unheard, unproclaimed. Our worship isn't complete until the scroll is opened. Until our hearts are opened and we know that this word that God is speaking is for us, is for me, it is for you. 
on an individual and deeply personal level, God speaks, as well as a communal for all people level. And so John weaves from being cut off from God's will and purpose for him and for all people. But then an elder whispers in his ear, do not weep. See the Lion of Judah, the Root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the seven seals. And hearing of the legendary Lion of Judah who conquered enemies with the sword and was revered for his prowess on the battlefield, in hearing of the promised root of David, King David, who was all, who also triumphed and was declared worthy as he conquered his enemies in violent battles, John looks, but what he sees is a lamb. The lamb, this very strange-looking lamb, right, that has seven horns and seven eyes, and if that's not strange enough, it looks as though it has been slain, and yet it is living. And it stands at the throne ready to open the seals on the scroll. Now, the slaughtered but living lamb is the main image of Christ in Revelation. The lamb was the sacrifice offered for the sins of Israel on the altar of God at the heart of the temple. It was the offering that provided the lamb's blood for the door frames, right? So that the angel of death would pass over the Israelites and provide their escape from a life of slavery in Egypt. It is the exact opposite, as you heard Danielle sharing, of a lion, right? Lions are ferocious and feared and kings of the jungle. Lambs are cute and cuddly, aren't they? You just want to, like, snuggle up to them, even though they're probably not actually that soft. Lambs are skittish. They're always on the lookout for danger. They're obstinate. And they're not, they're not really that smart and sometimes easily subdued. Jesus, depicted as the slaughtered but living lamb, sends a clear message that God's kingdom, that God's economy, God's way of doing things is in stark contrast to the rest of the world and the way that the world works. While the world seeks to conquer through violence and battle and force of will and power, God's victory comes through self-sacrifice self on behalf of the other comes through completely selfless love. God's power is exercised through what God suffers for others and not what God wins for God's self. Jesus, the slaughtered lamb, reveals that Jesus was not some passive recipient of violence who could do nothing to stop from death on the cross. Jesus chooses to die this way not so that he can join the rank of martyrs, but to reveal the boundless nature of God's love. To show us just how far God is willing to go for you, right? The cross, we must remember, that was a scandalous way to die. It was not how dignitaries and, or the God, the Messiah, the chosen one, was supposed to die. It was humiliating and excruciating and a scandal for the people who followed Jesus to have him die in this way. But for Jesus, it was a deliberate act that showed how God's kingdom is created and what it means to be part of that kingdom. Whatever comes from here, and it just gets more sensational from here, I know you've all been waiting. <laughs> the really, the really good stuff in Revelation, the really sensational stuff, it's coming. Come back next week. Whatever comes from here, whatever is revealed after this moment, it is the lamb, the slaughtered but living lamb who is at the heart of the message, is at the heart of the revelation, is already before any other battle victorious. And as Jesus takes up the scroll, not only are the four creatures and the 24 elders in worship now, but more angels than John can count, 10,000 times 10,000, and soon it is all of creation 
right? All of the earth and under the earth, they are all there worshiping God, raising their voices in praise for the one who simply knocks on the door of our hearts and waits patiently for us to come to our senses, to come to a place where we too can see the gift of the Lamb, the unconditional love and grace that he offers for me, for you. And to know that that gift makes all the difference, no matter what comes. Holy, holy, holy is the God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing, praise to the King of Kings. Praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything. You are. Thank you. 